now let's look at some ways on how to assess normality. How to determine if the curve is indeed normally distributed. So we've already seen a few different ways, right? Um, we can look at the histogram to see if it's a, is it bell-shaped or mound-shaped. Um, we can look at box plots. This, this helps us determine symmetry more than anything else. Um, a couple of new things. We can create what's called a normal probability plot. And we can do this in mini tab or on the TI. It should be a relatively straight diagonal line. Um, or we can create what's called a QQ plot. Very similar. It's just sort of a reflected version of the normal probability plot. And I'll show you how to do both of these in StatCrunch. StatCrunch doesn't really have the normal probability plot per se, but it does have the QQ plot. Um, and the same thing for this one straight diagonal line for a normal distribution. And there's a, uh, for you number of people out there that want a number, uh, there's something called the Pearson's index. There are a bunch of little indexes to determine um, if the skewness is out of whack or not, or if, or if we can say it claim in normality. Okay, so example 13. The following relative frequency histogram represents the wait time in a line in minutes for a roller coaster. Determine whether or, or not the histogram indicates that a normal distribution could be used as a model for the variable. So there's our data. I'm actually going to pull this one up and so this is um, from Sullivan's text um, 7 for example 3. If we're not using that text while you're watching this video I will hopefully get the data set up for you to to play with or you can just kind of watch me do it and then when we do the ones in class or for homework I'll make sure I provide the data sets. Um, I wouldn't want you to type all that in. Okay so let me go over here to StatCrunch. 7.4 example 3 right here. Okay, wait times. So what are we going to do here? Let's go ahead and create a histogram. Wait times. Next. Technically relative frequency, but it will give us the same shape, so I don't usually worry about that. Ooh, it does not look normal, does it? So let's just do a few more. Um, I'll leave that up. Let's do a box plot. And you want to get pretty, pretty good at doing these without a whole lot of fanfare. So there's a box plot. Again, box plot does not look normal. I know some of you do not like the box when it's vertical, so let's draw them horizontally. And we can even go back here and make some outliers if we are already. Yeah, got some outliers there. Okay, so box plot. And let me show you the new plot that we can do. It is called a QQ plot. So QQ plot. Again, um, nothing here to draw. I was hoping they had uh, some boundaries, but they don't. Create graph. And again, the, the points need to lie you know, relatively close around this line, particularly in the middle here. It's pretty clear that this does not follow a straight line pattern um, for, um, for the wait times. Let's go back to the presentation here. And I think I've got those staggered for. So they're um, the histogram and box plot. Um, and there's my QQ plot and mini tab. Um, we've got a similar one called probability plot. Just go up to graphics and choose probability plot. Um, again, if you can kind of see this, um, the QQ plot, if we just flipped it, if we just rotated this around, it's exactly the same as this one. Sort of reflect it. How this one comes this way, this one goes up. It follows exactly the same pattern. This one goes to the right a, bit, a little bit, this one goes up a little bit. So it just reflected around. But it's not linear. Um, so the mini, what I like about Minitab's output is it gives you these little bands here. And the dots pretty much need to stay within those bands. Okay, we get a little more latitude here on the ends, but um, you know, they need to be sort of be in here somewhere. And they're not. They definitely follow a non-linear pattern, right? And then let's do Pearson's index. So a lot of students like this. I didn't use to, this is not in the book, I don't think. Um, but a lot of students like to have a number. They, I mean, use, reading those plots can sometimes be like reading tea leaves. It's a little bit hard to, uh, hard to nail it down. I mean, that one was pretty obvious. Sometimes they get a little tricky. So to give you another index um, that's not just kind of looking at a graph and it's somewhat subjective, um, if the this Pearson index, um, if it's greater than or equal to one or less than or equal to negative one, um, then we say it's skewed. It's significantly skewed. So basically, the Pearson index needs to be in between negative one and sorry, negative one and positive one. Okay, so it needs to be in between negative one and one. 
So for this problem, the Pearson index, we put in the mean, put in the standard deviation again, sorry, the mean, uh, median, minus divided by standard deviation, and we get 1.24, which is outside of those bound, bounds. Um, this is greater, which is greater than 1, so it's significantly skewed. We could tell that by looking at it, um, but sometimes it can get a little tricky. And again, we use all of these. We don't just look at one to see if it is. We, we sort of look, look to all of these, particularly when it's not clear. Now, I'll be honest, in the very first one, once I saw the histogram, I probably didn't need to do box plots and the QQ plot, probability plot, and Pearson's index. It was pretty clear it wasn't normal. Sometimes they get a little trickier. Here's another formula. Um, this is the one that Excel uses, and a lot of you use Excel. So this is the one that Excel uses. We won't be using this one, but um, Excel has sort of a skewness index, and this is the one it uses. Okay, see if you can do this one all your own. So we're going to use um, StatCrunch mini tab, or you can use a TI um, calculator to crunch this out. So this is um, game of golf distance control is just as important um, as how far a player hits the ball. Suppose Michael wants, went to the driving range with his range finder and hit 75 golf balls with his pitching wedge and measure the distance each ball traveled in yards. And then we get the following data. So use mini tab or some other statistical software to construct a relative frequency histogram. Um, comment on the shape of the histogram. Okay, so again, I'll do this one live for you. Let's roll over here. I just put in its pitching wedge. I just put wedge into the search property. Got pitching wedge. Um, go ahead and click graphics. Let's do a histogram. Click on pitching wedge. Relative frequency. And there it is. And if we wanted to, we could um, overlay the normal. And there we go. Doesn't look perfectly normal, but you know, this is one of the ones that may be in a, in a gray area. Um, so let's look at some other ones. Let's look at the box plot. Again, let's go ahead and create that. Box plot looks pretty symmetric, right? A little bit more on the right, but we can't go for perfect perfection on these. Um, let's do a QQ plot on that. So pitching wedge distance. Again, I'm not going to worry about labeling those. So it lies pretty much, I mean, it sort of has a linear pattern. It starts down low and, and comes up. It definitely moves in a linear pattern, right? Uh, let me show you this on the calculator. You know, if you don't have StatCrunch at your fingertips, uh, we can certainly use the calculator. I've already put this data in. I put it into a list called um, wedge. So. Let me um, turn this on, and if I do a, I can do a histogram, or let me first do, let's do a QQ plot, which is this, this probability plot. This actually is a probability plot, not a QQ plot. So I put my data list was, I called it pitch, so I could archive it, and we always put it against the x-axis. Okay, so let's do a, make sure it's on, and we'll do a zoom 9. And there it is. It sort of goes up linearly, right? I mean, we could kind of imagine a straight line being drawn through that. Um, I could do a histogram with that. So let me turn this off. But I don't want to change it yet. I want to, well, I guess I could go ahead and change it. Just make it a histogram. Leave my data pitch in there. So let's turn it back on. Again, frequency at 1. And we'll do a zoom 9. Okay, so yeah, that looks you know, pretty normal. So again, there are my, my, my plots. I, I think it does accurately describe the distance that Michael hits a pitching wedge. Um, it, it, we can kind of, we saw the normal over here, normal on that. It's relatively symmetric. We saw the QQ plot um, and, um, and the probability plot was along the straight line. So, and I did not compute Pearson's index, but I imagine that would give me a value of in between negative 1 and 1. Okay, again, those, those are all the plots that you can have. Again, I kind of like the way Minitab has it better because everything falls in here. Now, if one point comes outside line, we don't automatically discount it. Um, it's just sort of a, to get our bearings of, of where we are. And all these points are sort of within those boundaries.
we're looking for the trend and pattern. You know, if it went up like this, like the other one did, or did a snake or something like that, that's what we look at. <laughs> ah, I guess I did use the Pearson's index here. So we plop that in, we get negative 0.103, was certainly in between negative 1 and 1. Okay, um, part E, determine the mean, the standard deviation of the sample. Uh, we should be pretty good at that by now, either using StatCrunch or the calculator. And we're looking at the sample data here. So part F, um, use the sample mean standard deviation from part B, um, or from actually just part E, the one we just did, as estimates for the population mean standard deviation. Draw a normal curve for the distribution of the pitching wedge distances. Now this is a big problem. Um, not a problem as in that we can't do it, but this is a this is a really good question, right? So we're going to use our mean standard deviation that we got right here, 99.9 .9 and 2.9. Go ahead and draw those out. Um, again, um, my sample standard deviation, 2.9. Again, we just add 2.9 each time, subtract 2.9 each time. And there's my curve. Okay, so now use part G, use the normal model from E, um, to, or actually F, right, the one we just did, I'm off one here, to find the probability that a ball travels between 93 and 98 yards. So now we're using my model. I can sort of graph and shade this, right? So we'll call that 93. And where's 98? I'll call that 98 right there. Again, just somewhere in between the, these ones we have labeled. Don't get too picky on that. Again, we've done enough of these. I don't think I need to show you um, this live. You have normal CDF, left bound, comma, right bound, comma, mean, comma, standard deviation. About uh, 0.2475, or it's about 25%. So would it be unusual for Michael to hit a ball with his wedge over 106 yards? So what does this mean, unusual? We usually define this, as mentioned earlier, if our probability is less than 0.05. And we'll see kind of why we choose that a little bit later on, but you know, if it's under a 5% chance, uh, we would be unusual. It would be extremely un unusual if it was less than maybe 0.01. So we crunch this out, we get 0 0.0177. So we would consider this unusual uh, to, to be over 106 yards, 106 right here. So, I mean, almost all of them were not um, greater than 106 yards. Uh, very few of them. Um, would have been maybe one or two. If you go back and look at the actual data, I mean, this is just a model, but look at the actual data and see how many were over 106 yards. I went back and checked, and we actually only have two. So only two of the 75 were um, from the actual data uh, were greater than 106 yards. So how does this compare? I'm just kind of curious here. Two divided by 75 about 0.026, which is pretty close to our 0 0.0177, a um, very small number. So, you know, about 0 0.03, this one here is about 0 0.02. So again, our model is just a model. I mean, all models are wrong, right? Some of them are useful. This one can be useful for us. And we'll see that in future chapters on how we can actually utilize the power of this normal model to, to answer some pretty, pretty good questions. And that's it for the normal distribution. So we've been able to, is able to streamline all of chapter, in this case we're using chapter seven, but whatever book we're using on the normal model into one lesson. Um, and we will do the concept workshop in class if you're in the in class um, class, not the online class.